and welcome back to Consumer Choice Radio, broadcasting on Saga 960 AM and the Big Talker 1067 FM. We are very delighted for our next guest on the program. We have Dr. Kimberly Josephson. She is an assistant professor of business and the associate dean for the Breen Center for Graduate Success at the Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Dr. Josephson, thanks so much for coming on Consumer Choice Radio. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Of course. And uh, I wanted to highlight uh, two articles of yours that we will put in the show notes that people will be able to see afterwards. The first one, why competition is the antidote to big tech's bad behavior, not to politician. If given a chance, the market will eventually provide solutions to many of the grievances stemming from big tech's clumsy efforts to control user content. This is obviously still a very hot topic. Uh, we have an entire... Uh, we're deluged with all the different congressional testimonies and, and speech online. Um, if you could kind of summarize for our listeners, what was your thought in sort of penning this article and, and what is your reaction to everything we've seen uh, the last uh, several months over free speech concerns and, and different companies and, and how legislation plays into it? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, something that I pointed out in the article is that there's always been an ever present concern for monopolies, right? Control of the market. Uh, but really, whenever there's a demand in the market, entrepreneurs, opportunists, they'll respond to it. Uh, and so it, it's best to kind of let the market sort things out, because when you have government interference or policy that comes into play, that could actually deter uh, those opportunists, those entrepreneurs to want to take advantage and get involved. Um, and so in the article, I even reference how you know, the big box stores were going to replace the mom and pop shops. And now you have the online e-tailers that are replacing the big box stores um, and things like that. And so the best thing to do is really just to kind of let, you know, let time play out. And as we see, actually, um, we do have a whole slew of different platforms that are popping up. It seems like almost daily, right? Uh, so right now, like Clubhouse is now the hot new cool thing. Um, and, and so these different channels, they'll, they'll come about if there's a need. Um, whenever, you know, you have a supposed monopoly, it's usually because that is the uh, leader in the industry, which means that they're doing something right. So sometimes it takes a while for entrepreneurs to leverage uh, what it is others are doing, learn by doing, um, and then figure out, okay, how can I do this better? And if this is the top leader, right, I'm going to learn from it, and then I'm also going to try to outperform them. So Facebook and Twitter, yeah, they were, they were the leaders, and in terms of um, wanting to censorship or things of that nature, in all honesty, that's in their power to do. It's their company. Um, it is their platform. Um, and yes, it's disheartening for those that really are, were enjoying those free services, but essentially they were even free services. It's not even like they were taking things away from us that we, uh, we paid for. It was something that we were using and then, you know, they decided to self-regulate. And I think big tech is even a little unsure of, uh, you know, how they should deal with free speech concerns because some of them have even reached out saying, hey, government regulate us, help us. We don't even know how to navigate this. And that's really strange to me. Um, so once again, in, in my article, I kind of just focus on, hey, you know, do we really want to get government involved? Do we really want more policies? Because once you do that, it's hard to retract it, right? Once government gets, and, and also we could attribute the success of big tech to the limited regulations that happened early on. Because uh, government didn't know how to regulate big tech. If you think in regards to really um, innovative industries, ones that are growing quickly, it's the ones where government has the least interference. Um, think about Uber and Airbnb and all those and how that sprung up so quickly. And then the government was like, how do we regulate this? How do we you know, manage it? And it's creating these complications now after the fact. Um, but less interference is usually better because once that interference uh, starts, it does make it more difficult for new entrants to come in, uh, creates a deterrence maybe for entrepreneurs who want to enter. And, uh, and once again, you, you, it's hard to take away policy once it's put in place. Yeah, it's funny, whenever I see politicians kind of clamoring on about monopolistic status, I, I tend to bring up the old headlines from the MySpace era when they were essentially saying the same thing, MySpace is so powerful. Is MySpace ever going to lose its monopoly status? And I mean, for a lot of people listening on the radio now, 
I don't know, maybe half of them probably have no idea what MySpace even is, um, let alone what it was sold for and, and all of those things. So it's always interesting to see these arguments replicate themselves over the span of 15, 20 years, where I'm sure if we were to revisit this again, so long as um, barriers to entry are not put up, we could be having a similar conversation and be like, oh yeah, remember when we used to post things on Facebook? And, and, and our kids or grandkids will look at us and be like, dad, you're being old now. Like, why are you talking about Facebook? Um, but on, on, yeah. yeah. And I actually really appreciate that you brought up MySpace because I was a late adopter to Facebook. I loved my MySpace. I was a big fan, right? And that was a way to show your music and how you were cool and things like that. Your top, your top six friends. friends. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, now students, you know, all of my students at LBC, Lebanon Valley College, you know, they almost, oh, Facebook's not that cool anymore. It's not that hip. Actually, uh, Twitter and Facebook are, are used a lot by kind of, um, once again, the older generation and even legacy media and things. So they're figuring out, you know, how to use TikTok and these other forms. And, you know, so by the time, uh, by the time maybe government figures out how to regulate Facebook, uh, probably won't matter. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I can see that. Uh, one line that I wanted to go back to in your article. So like any vice that is in our life, individuals need to take on some personal accountability for what has transpired in the online and trading realms. Uh, you were also speaking about the GameStop frenzy and some of the investing stuff. And this is, uh, you know, from a, I guess, many weeks ago. So there's so much that's transpired. Uh, talk us through that as well, because we don't often talk about personal responsibility or accountability uh, when it comes to using these platforms, it's always assumed that the only people who get to make any decisions in this realm are the companies and the government. And it seems as if consumers are kind of left out. Right, right. Well, and in, in calling it a vice too, it's, it's, I guess, just a personal opinion in that, you know, we've become somewhat obsessed with the online realm and with our phones and what are people saying and how many people are liking things. I mean, I'll be honest, even with my articles, it's like, ooh, how many people liked it? Did anyone share it, right? So we become like kind of, you know, enthralled with these forms to interact and engage. And there is, a, in a sense, the madness of crowds. And so like with what we saw happen with GameStop, like that was just kind of wild and, and, and unique. And that was all done on the online, online realm and thinking like, hey, we're going to, we're going to, you know, tear down the system or we're going to rework it. And it's like, but what is your actual goal? What are you really looking to accomplish, right? So a lot of these, um, you know, when you hear people speaking out about things, but there's no other alternative, or maybe even not a full understanding of how this works, how hedge funds work, how trading stocks work, like, hey, you should have someone um, who knows how to invest to help you and, and, and guide you through this process. Um, so yeah, so it just, it was just kind of interesting that all of this stuff was happening around the same time. So the concern of big tech censorship and then, you know, the GameStop, uh, you know, kind of mob almost that happened. And, and people were saying, the government needs to do something, right? We need policies. This shouldn't happen. It should be regulated. And it's kind of like, well, you know what? Sometimes we need to be allowed to make mistakes, right? And realize, oh, that was not a smart move. Oh, I shouldn't have posted that online. Or maybe I shouldn't be following, you know, this influencer, or yeah, if I'm going to make a big investment, <laughs> let me go through the proper channels and make sure that I'm smart about that investment. Um, you know, once again, once government gets involved, and, and this is not to say that government shouldn't, you know, play a role at all. But the more we use government as a crutch and rely on it and seek allotments or safety nets or safe, yeah, safety nets or what have you, um, you know, it's, it's hard to then take away, once again, that interference and that autonomy. Um, something I find really interesting because I am a business professor. So in my courses at LBC, uh, we talk about there's been a real dramatic shift within organizations um, that focus on the empowerment of employees and granting autonomy and the decentralization of power. And companies are seeing that their organizations are much more productive, uh, have a better work culture when there is this kind of flexible environment of here are our goals, here are the tasks that need to happen. 
but I'm going to let you figure it out, right? And I'm going to provide the resources needed and support if you need it. But really, you know, this is this is your responsibility. Have at it, right? And and we encourage you to collaborate and network with others within the industry and sector. Um, granting that autonomy and giving that power to employees is, is proving to have a very positive effect. So I don't know why in society we don't take that same approach. We look really to government as in this kind of top-down control, whereas, you know what, as individuals, we should be engaged in our own communities, in our own societal welfare within those communities, um, and have that decentralization of power and autonomy in regards to what it is we decide to support um, or not. Yeah, it's funny. You should send some of that research to Paul Krugman because he just wrote an absolutely terrible op-ed in the New York Times basically saying, Americans have too much choice. They're too dumb. They make mistakes. And we need to stop that. Uh, but quickly uh, pivoting to your, your second article in regards to corporations meeting consumer um, consumer demand or what consumers want, want rather than catering to causes. Uh, walk our listeners through what your argument is. And if you could maybe help us find the line between when causes and consumer demand merge, because obviously I can think of several instances where uh, corporate interests do kind of blend the two. Uh, but I'm interested to hear what your, your take is on where kind of co corporate social responsibility has gone as of late. Sure, sure. Yeah, so once again, as a business professor, we talk about kind of um, theory and history in regards to business practices. And there are these eras of marketing that organizations have gone through in regards to, you know, the production era. This is what we make, take it or leave it. The selling era um, in terms of, okay, you know, we're going to leverage economies of scale. And the more we produce, the more we can sell, and the more we can sell, the more money we're going to make. And then you have the rise of like, intense competition where organizations realize okay no we need to have this marketing concept and not just in terms of what it is we sell but how it generates value for the consumer and then also even differentiation um yeah differentiation strategies in regard to branding um the total offering the package so it's not just a car right it's the status symbol it's a certain brand it's a certain it has certain features and then we're at this now, this new era of kind of this, um, you know, concern for society. And this is another way for companies to differentiate themselves, right? Um, I might have a great, you know, yeah, brand. I might have a great slogan. I might really appeal to consumers. But once again, competition is so intense. So how can I further create not just an appeal, but almost an emotional bond with my consumers, right? Because emotions actually serve as uh, kind of like a cementing um, element in regards to relationships, right? And so organizations look to do that as well. Um, there's also been a, a push for kind of the stakeholder mindset where organizations, you know, need to think more broadly. Um, I, I often use, uh, I call it the spice model with my students, whereas we think in terms of our stakeholders as our, our um, society at large, our partners, so meaning kind of suppliers, distributors, um, investors, customers, and employees. Those are kind of like your core stakeholders. Um, and if we're thinking about those, right, different organizations might prioritize uh, different aspects at different times. So some might feel like, hey, I need to focus my efforts more towards customer satisfaction, whereas other organizations might say, hey, I need to really focus on my employees. If my employees are happy, they're going to be more productive and better, which is going to spill over to my customers being happier and better. Um, but this greater focus on societal welfare is kind of a slippery slope um, because, you know, it's going outside the realm of business. Um, you know, you, you went into business to produce something, to sell something. And you might spread yourself too thin if you take on um, more than you can chew, essentially. Uh, sometimes good intentions lead to bad results. Um, and then also applying this pressure on organizations that, hey, you have to um, take part in social welfare. Um, it can be disconcerting because businesses can be very powerful and they are not elected. They should not necessarily represent um, you know, the people. Uh, and then also it might 
you know, make other businesses that aren't partaking in social causes look negative, whereas in reality, they maybe can't afford to. Um, maybe they are just focusing on their area of expertise. So I, I worry about businesses feeling a pressure to take on kind of a social cause or social charge and vice versa, even for consumers to, you know, vote with their dollars based off of a social issue rather than, is this a good product? Is this something that is going to improve, um, you know, my personal well-being, my satisfaction, provide value to me, or am I paying really just, you know, once again, for the social cause? Um, and in my article, I actually talk about several examples of where, um, in some cases, it was intention, good intentions gone wrong, and in others, it was really to pull the wool over our, our eyes and make the company look like, hey, look, I'm so great, I'm being sustainable. And, well, actually, that was almost almost seemed like a cover up or a distraction for what was really going on. We've been speaking with Dr. Kimberly Josephson here on Consumer Choice Radio. She's an assistant professor of business and the associate dean for the Breen Center for Graduate Success at Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Dr. Josephson, thanks so much for being on the program. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. 